Book Two, Chapter Ten of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Ten, Departure from the Marquesas, A Description of the Situation, Extent, Figure, and Appearance of the Several Islands with some account of the inhabitants, their customs, dress, habitations, food, weapons, and canoes, 1774, April. At three o'clock in the afternoon we weighed, and stood over from St. Christina for La Dominica, in order to take a view of the west side of that isle. But as it was dark before we reached it, the night was spent in plying between the two isles. The next morning we had a full view of the south-west point, from which the coast trended north-east, so that it was not probable we should find good anchorage on that side, as being exposed to the easterly winds. We had now but little wind, and that very variable, with showers of rain. At length we got a breeze at east-north-east, with which we steered to the south. At five o'clock p.m., Resolution Bay bore east north east a half east, distant five leagues, and the island Magdalena south east about nine leagues distance. This was the only sight we had of this isle. From hence I steered south south west a half west for Otaheite, with a view of falling in with some of those isles discovered by former navigators, especially those discovered by the Dutch whose situations are not well determined. But it will be necessary to return to the Marquesas, which were, as I have already observed, first discovered by Mendana, a Spaniard, and from him obtained the general name they now bear, as well as those of the different isles. The nautical account of them, in volume 1, page 61, of Dalrymple's collection of voyages to the South Seas, is deficient in nothing but situation. This was my chief reason for touching at them. The settling this point is the more useful, as it will in a great measure fix the situations of Mendana's other discoveries. The Marquesas are five in number, viz. La Magdalena, San Pedro, La Dominica, Santa Cristina, and Hood's Island, which is the northernmost, situated in latitude 9 degrees 26 minutes south, and north 13 degrees west, five leagues and a half distant from the east point of La Dominica, which is the largest of all the isles, extending east and west six leagues. It hath an unequal breadth, and is about 15 or 16 leagues in circuit. It is full of rugged hills, rising in ridges directly from the sea. These ridges are disjoined by deep valleys, which are clothed with wood, as are the sides of some of the hills. The aspect, however, is barren, but it is nevertheless inhabited. Latitude 9 degrees 44 minutes 30 seconds south St. Pedro, which is about three leagues in circuit and of a good height, lies south four leagues and a half from the east end of La Dominica. We know not if it be inhabited. Nature has not been very bountiful to it. St. Christina lies under the same parallel, three or four leagues more to the west. This island stretches north and south, is nine miles long in that direction, and about seven leagues in circuit. A narrow ridge of hills of considerable height extends the whole length of the island. There are other ridges which, rising from the sea, and with an equal ascent, join the main ridge. These are disjoined by deep, narrow valleys which are fertile, adorned with fruit and other trees, and watered by fine streams of excellent water. La Magdalena we only saw at a distance. Its situation must be nearly in the latitude of 10 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 138 degrees 50 minutes so that these isles occupy one degree in latitude and near half a degree in longitude, viz. from 138 degrees 47 minutes to 139 degrees 13 minutes west, which is the longitude of the west end of La Dominica. 
The port of Madre de Dios, which I named Resolution Bay, is situated near the middle of the west side of St. Christina, and under the highest land in the island. In latitude 9 degrees 55 minutes 30 seconds, longitude 139 degrees 8 minutes 40 seconds west, and north 15 seconds west from the west end of La Dominica. The south point of the bay is a steep rock of considerable height, terminating at the top in a peaked hill, above which you will see a pathway leading up a narrow ridge to the summit of the hills. The north point is not so high, and rises with a more gentle slope. They are a mile from each other, in the direction of north by east and south by west. In the bay, which is near three-quarters of a mile deep, and has from thirty-four to twelve fathoms water, with a clean sandy bottom, are two sandy coves, divided from each other by a rocky point. In each is a rivulet of excellent water. The northern cove is the most commodious for wooding and watering. Here is a little waterfall mentioned by Quiros, Mendana's pilot, but the town or village is in the other cove. There are several other coves or bays on this side of the island, and some of them, especially to the northward, may be mistaken for this. Therefore, the best direction is the bearing of the west end of La Dominica. The trees, plants, and other productions of these isles, so far as we know, are nearly the same as at Otaheite and the Society Isles. The refreshments to be got are hogs, fowls, plantains, yams, and some other roots. Likewise breadfruit and coconuts, but of these not many. At first these articles were purchased with nails. Beads, looking-glasses, and such trifles, which are so highly valued at the Society Islands, are in no esteem here, and even nails at last lost their value for the other articles far less useful. The inhabitants of these islands collectively are without exception the finest race of people in this sea. For fine shape and regular features they perhaps surpass all other nations. Nevertheless, the affinity of their language to that spoken in Otaheite and the Society Isles shows that they are of the same nation. Oedidi could converse with them tolerably well, though we could not. But it was easy to see that their language was nearly the same. The men are punctured or curiously tattooed from head to foot. The figures are various and seem to be directed more by fancy than custom. These punctuations make them look dark. But the women, who are but little punctured, youths and young children, who are not at all, are as fair as some Europeans. The men are in general tall, that is about five feet ten inches or six feet. But I saw none that were fat and lusty like the Eries of Otaheite. Nor did I see any that could be called meagre. Their teeth are not so good, nor are their eyes so full and lively as those of many other nations. Their hair, like ours, is of many colours, except red, of which I saw none. Some have it long, but the most general custom is to wear it short, except a bunch on each side of the crown, which they tie in a knot. They observe different modes in trimming the beard, which is in general long. Some part it, and tie it in two bunches under the chin, others plait it, some wear it loose, and others quite short. Their clothing is the same as at Otaheite, and made of the same materials, but they have it not in such plenty, nor is it so good. The men, for the most part, have nothing to cover their nakedness, except the mara, as it is called at Otaheite which is a slip of cloth passed round the waist and betwixt the legs. This simple dress is quite sufficient for the climate, and answers every purpose modesty requires. The dress of the women is a piece of cloth wrapped round the loins like a petticoat, which reaches down below the middle of the leg, and a loose mantle over their shoulders. Their principal headdress, and what appears to be their chief ornament, is a sort of broad fillet, 
curiously made of the fibres of the husk of coconuts. In the front is fixed a mother-of-pearl shell, wrought round to the size of a tea saucer. Before that is another smaller one, a very fine tortoise shell, perforated into curious figures. Also before, and in the centre of that, is another round piece of mother-of-pearl, about the size of half a crown, and before this another piece of perforated tortoise shell, about the size of a shilling. Besides this decoration in front, some have it also on each side, but in smaller pieces, and all have fixed to them the tail feathers of cocks or tropic birds, which, when the fillet is tied on, stand upright, so that the whole together makes a very sightly ornament. They wear round the neck a kind of ruff or necklace, call it which you please, made of light wood, the out and upper side covered with small red peas, which are fixed on with gum. They also wear small bunches of human hair, fastened to a string, and tied round the arms and legs. Sometimes, instead of hair, they make use of short feathers, but all the above-mentioned ornaments are seldom seen on the same person. I saw only the chief who came to visit us, completely dressed in this manner. Their ordinary ornaments are necklaces and amulets made of shells, etc. I did not see any with earrings, and yet all of them had their ears pierced. Their dwellings are in the valleys, and on the sides of the hills, near their plantations. They are built after the same manner as at Otaheite, but are much meaner, and only covered with the leaves of the bread-tree. The most of them are built on a square or oblong pavement of stone, raised some height above the level of the ground. They likewise have such pavements near their houses, on which they sit to eat and amuse themselves. In the article of eating, these people are by no means so cleanly as the Otaheitans. They are likewise dirty in their cookery. Pork and fowls are dressed in an oven of hot stones as at Otaheite, but fruit and roots they roast on the fire, and, after taking off the rind or skin, put them into a platter or trough with water, out of which I have seen both men and hogs eat at the same time. I once saw them make a batter of fruit and roots diluted with water, in a vessel that was loaded with dirt, and out of which the hogs had been but that moment eating, without giving it the least washing, or even washing their hands, which were equally dirty, and when I expressed the dislike, was laughed at. I know not if all are so. The actions of a few individuals are not sufficient to fix a custom on a whole nation. Nor can I say if it is the custom for men and women to have separate messes. I saw nothing to the contrary. Indeed, I saw but few women upon the whole. They seem to have dwellings or strongholds on the summits of the highest hills. These we only saw by the help of our glasses, for I did not permit any of our people to go there, as we were not sufficiently acquainted with the disposition of the natives, which, I believe, is humane and pacific. Their weapons are clubs and spears resembling those of Otaheite, but somewhat neater. They have also slings, with which they throw stones with great velocity and to a good distance, but not with a good aim. Their canoes are made of wood and pieces of the bark of a soft tree, which grows near the sea in great plenty, and is very tough and proper for the purpose. They are from sixteen to twenty feet long and about fifteen inches broad. The head and stern are made of two solid pieces of wood. The stern rises or curves a little, but in an irregular direction, and ends in a point. The head projects out horizontally, and is carved into some faint and very rude resemblance of a human face. They are rowed by paddles, and some have a sort of latin sail made of matting. Hogs were the only quadrupeds we saw, and cocks and hens the only tame fowls. However, 
the woods seem to abound with small birds of a very beautiful plumage and fine notes but the fear of alarming the natives hindered us from shooting so many of them as might otherwise have been done end of book two chapter ten recording by david cole medway massachusetts chapter eleven of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume one by james cook this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by david cole chapter eleven a description of several islands discovered or seen in the passage from the Marquesas to Otaheite, with an account of a naval review, 1774 April. With a fine easterly wind I steered southwest, southwest by west, and west by south till the 17th, at ten o'clock in the morning, when land was seen bearing west a half north, which, upon a nearer approach, was found to be a string of low islets connected together by a reef of coral rocks. We ranged the northwest coast at a distance of one mile from shore to three quarters of its length, which in the whole is near four leagues, when we came to a creek or inlet that seemed to open a communication into the lake in the middle of the isle. As I wanted to obtain some knowledge of the produce of these half-drowned isles, we brought two, hoisted out a boat, and sent the master in to sound, there being no soundings without. As we ran along the coast, the natives appeared in several places, armed with long spears and clubs, and some were got together on one side of the creek. When the master returned, he reported that there was no passage into the lake by the creek, which was fifty fathoms wide at the entrance and thirty deep, farther in thirty wide and twelve deep, that the bottom was everywhere rocky and the sides bounded by a wall of coral rocks. We were under no necessity to put the ship into such a place as this, but as the natives had shown some signs of a friendly disposition by coming peaceably to the boat and taking such things as were given them, I sent two boats well armed ashore under the command of Lieutenant Cooper, with a view of having some intercourse with them, and to give Mr. Forster an opportunity of collecting something in his way. We saw our people land without the least opposition being made by a few natives who were on the shores. Some little time after, observing forty or fifty more, all armed coming to join them, we stood close in shore, in order to be ready to support our people in case of an attack. But nothing of this kind happened, and soon after our boats returned aboard, when Mr. Cooper informed me that on his landing only a few of the natives met him on the beach, but there were many more in the skirts of the woods with spears in their hands. The presents he made them were received with great coolness, which plainly showed we were unwelcome visitors. When their reinforcement arrived he thought proper to embark, as the day was already far spent, and I had given orders to avoid an attack by all possible means. When his men got into the boats, some were for pushing them off, others for detaining them, but at last they suffered them to depart at their leisure. They brought aboard five dogs which seemed to be in plenty there. We saw no fruit but coconuts, of which they got by exchanges two dozen. One of our people got a dog for a single plantain, which led us to conjecture that they had none of this fruit. This island, which is called by the inhabitants Tiukia, was discovered and visited by Commodore Byron. It has something of an oval shape is about ten leagues in circuit, lying in the direction of east-south-east and west-north-west, and situated in the latitude of fourteen degrees twenty-seven minutes thirty seconds south, longitude one forty-four degrees fifty-six minutes west. The inhabitants of this island, and perhaps of all the low ones, 
are of a much darker colour than those of the higher islands, and seem to be of a more ferine disposition. This may be owing to their situation, nature not having bestowed her favours to these low islands with that profusion she has done to some of the others. The inhabitants are chiefly beholden to the sea for their subsistence, consequently are much exposed to the sun and weather, and by that means become more dark in colour and more hardy and robust, for there is no doubt about their being of the same nation. Our people observed that they were stout, well-made men, and had the figure of a fish marked on their bodies, a very good emblem of their profession. On the eighteenth at daybreak, after having spent the night snaking short boards, we wore down to another isle we had in sight to the westward, which we reached by eight o'clock, and ranged the south-east side at one mile from shore. We found it to be just such another as that we had left, extending north-east and south-west near four leagues, and from five to three miles broad. It lies south-west by west, two leagues distant from the west end of Tiukia, and the middle is situated to the latitude of 14 degrees 37 minutes south, longitude 145 degrees 10 minutes west. These must be the same islands to which Commodore Byron gave the name of George's Islands. Their situation in longitude, which was determined by lunar observations made near the shores, and still farther corrected by the difference in longitude carried by the watch to Otaheite, is three degrees fifty-four minutes more east than he says they lie. This correction, I apprehend, may be applied to all the islands he discovered. After leaving these isles we steered south-south-west or half-west, and south-west by south, with a fine easterly gale, having signs of the vicinity of land, particularly a smooth sea. And on the 19th at seven in the morning, land was seen to the westward, which we bore down to, and reached the south-east end by nine o'clock. It proved to be another of these half-overflowed or drowned islands, which are so common in this part of the ocean. That is, a number of little isles, ranged in a circular form, connected together by a reef or wall of coral rock. The sea is in general everywhere on their outside unfathomable. All their interior parts are covered with water, abounding, I have been told, with fish and turtle, on which the inhabitants subsist, and sometimes exchange the latter with the high islanders for cloth, etc. These inland seas would be excellent harbours, were they not shut up from the access of shipping, which is the case with most of them, if we can believe the report of the inhabitants of the other isles. Indeed, few of them have been well searched by Europeans, the little prospect of meeting with fresh water having generally discouraged every attempt of this kind. I, who have seen a great many, have not yet seen an inlet into one. This island is situated in the latitude of 15 degrees 26 minutes, longitude 146 degrees 20 minutes. It is five leagues long in the direction of north northeast and south southwest, and about three leagues broad. As we drew near the south end, we saw from the masthead another of these low islands bearing southeast distant about four or five leagues, but being to windward we could not fetch it. Soon after a third appeared bearing southwest by south, for which we steered, and at two o'clock p.m. reached the east end, which is situated in latitude 15 degrees 47 minutes south, longitude 146 degrees 30 minutes west. This island extends west-northwest and east-southeast, and is seven leagues long in that direction, but its breadth is not above two. It is, in all respects, like the rest. Only here are fewer islets and less firm land on the reef which encloses the lake. 
As we ranged the north coast at the distance of half a mile, we saw people, huts, canoes, and places built, seemingly, for drying of fish. They seemed to be the same sort of people as on Tiukia, and were armed with long spikes like them. Drawing near the west end, we discovered another or fourth island bearing north-north-east. It seemed to be low, like the others, and lies west from the first isle, distant six leagues. These four isles I called Palliser's Isles, in honour of my worthy friend Sir Hugh Palliser, at this time controller of the navy. Not choosing to run further in the dark, we spent the night making short boards under the topsail, and on the twentieth at daybreak, hauled round the west end of the third isle, which was no sooner done than we found a great swell rolling in from the south, a sure sign that we were clear of these low islands, and as we saw no more land, I steered south-west a half-south for Hotahiti, having the advantage of a stout gale at east, attended with showers of rain. It cannot be determined, with any degree of certainty, whether the group of isles we had lately seen be any of those discovered by the Dutch navigators or no. The situation of their discoveries not being handed down to us with sufficient accuracy. It is, however, necessary to observe that this part of the ocean, that is, from the latitude of twenty degrees down to fourteen degrees or twelve degrees, and from the meridian of one thirty eight degrees to one forty eight or one fifty degrees west, is so strewn with these low isles that a navigator cannot proceed with too much caution. We made the high land of Otaheite on the 21st, and at noon were about 13 leagues east of Point Venus, for which we steered, and got pretty well in with it by sunset, when we shortened sail, and having spent the night, which was squally with rain, standing on and off, at eight o'clock the next morning, anchored in Matavai Bay, in seven fathoms water. This was no sooner known to the natives than many of them made us a visit, and expressed not a little joy in seeing us again. As my chief reason for putting in at this place was to give Mr. Wales an opportunity to know the error of the watch by the known longitude, and to determine anew her rate of going, the first thing we did was to land his instruments, and to erect tents for the reception of a guard and such other people, as it was necessary to have on shore. Sick we had none. The refreshments we had got at the Marquesas had removed every complaint of that kind. On the twenty-third showery weather, our very good friends the natives supplied us with fruit and fish sufficient for the whole crew. On the 24th, Otu the king and several other chiefs, with a train of attendants, paid us a visit, and brought as presents ten or a dozen large hogs, besides fruits, which made them exceedingly welcome. I was advertised of the king's coming, and looked upon it as a good omen. Knowing how much it was my interest to make this man my friend, I met him at the tents, and conducted him and his friends on board, in my boat, where they stayed dinner, after which they were dismissed with suitable presents, and highly pleased with the reception they had met with. Next morning we had much thunder, lightning, and rain. This did not hinder the king from making me another visit, and a present of a large quantity of refreshments. It hath been already mentioned, that when we were at the island of Amsterdam, we had collected, amongst other curiosities, some red parrot feathers. When this was known here, all the principal people of both sexes endeavoured to ingratiate themselves in our favour by bringing us hogs, fruit, and every other thing the island afforded, in order to obtain these valuable jewels. Our having these feathers was a fortunate circumstance, for as they were valuable to the natives, they became so to us, 
but more especially as my stock of trade was by this time greatly exhausted, so that, if it had not been for the feathers, I should have found it difficult to have supplied the ship with the necessary refreshments. When I put in at this island, I intended to stay no longer than till Mr. Wales had made the necessary observations for the purposes already mentioned, thinking we should meet with no better success than we did the last time we were here. But the reception we had already met with, and the few excursions we had made, which did not exceed the plains of Matavai and Opari, convinced us of our error. We found at these two places, built in building, a great number of large canoes and houses of every kind, people living in spacious habitations who had not a place to shelter themselves in eight months before, several large hogs about every house, and every other sign of a rising state. Judging from these favourable circumstances that we should not mend ourselves by removing to another island, I resolved to make a longer stay, and to begin with the repairs of the ship and stores, etc. Accordingly, I ordered the empty casks and sails to be got ashore to be repaired, the ship to be caulked, and the rigging to be overhauled, all of which the high southern latitudes had made indispensably necessary. On the morning of the 26th I went down to Opari, accompanied by some of the officers and gentlemen, to pay Otu a visit by appointment. As we drew near, we observed a number of large canoes in motion, but we were surprised, when we arrived, to see upwards of three hundred ranged in order, for some distance along the shore, all completely equipped and manned, besides a vast number of armed men upon the shore. So unexpected an armament neglected together in our neighbourhood, in the space of one night, gave rise to various conjectures. We landed, however, in the midst of them, and were received by a vast multitude, many of them under arms and many not. The cry of the latter was Tio no Otu, and that of the former, Tio no Tuaha. This chief, we afterwards learned, was admiral or commander of the fleet and troops present. The moment we landed I was met by a chief whose name was T, uncle to the king, and one of his prime ministers, of whom I inquired for Otu. Presently after we were met by Toha, who received me with great courtesy. He took me by the one hand and T by the other and without my knowing where they intended to carry me, dragged me, as it were, through the crowd that was divided into two parties, both of which professed themselves my friends, by crying out, Tio no Tuti. One party wanted me to go to Otu, and the other to remain with Toha. Coming to the visual place of audience, a mat was spread for me to sit down upon, and T left me to go and bring the king. Toha was unwilling I should sit down, partially insisting on my going with him, but as I knew nothing of this chief, I refused to comply. Presently T returned and wanted to conduct me to the king, taking hold of my hand for that purpose. This Toha opposed so that, between the one party and the other, I was like to have been torn in pieces, and was obliged to desire T to desist, and to leave me to the admiral and his party, who conducted me down to the fleet. As soon as we came before the admiral's vessel, we found two lines of armed men drawn up before her, to keep off the crowd, as I supposed, and to clear the way for me to go in. But as I was determined not to go, I made the water, which was between me and her, an excuse. This did not answer, for a man immediately squatted himself down at my feet, offering to carry me, and then I declared I would not go. That very moment Toha quitted me, without my seeing which way he went, nor would any one inform me. Turning myself round I saw T, 
who I believe, had never lost sight of me. Inquiring of him for the king, he told me he was gone into the country at and advised me to go to my boat, which we accordingly did, as soon as we could get collected together, for Mr. Edgecombe was the only person that could keep with me, the others being jostled about in the crowd, in the same manner we had been. When we got into our boat, we took our time to view this grand fleet. The vessels of war consisted of an hundred and sixty large double canoes, very well equipped, manned, and armed. But I am not sure that they had their full complement of men or rowers. I rather think not. The chiefs, and all those on the fighting stages, were dressed in their war habits, that is, in a vast quantity of cloth, turbans, breastplates, and helmets. Some of the latter were of such a length as greatly to encumber the wearer. Indeed, their whole dress seemed to be ill-calculated for the day of battle, and to be designed more for show than use. Be this as it may, it certainly added grandeur to the prospect, as they were so complacent as to show themselves to the best advantage. The vessels were decorated with flags, streamers, etc., so that the whole made a grand and noble appearance, such as we had never seen before in this sea, and what no one would have expected. Their instruments of war were clubs, spears, and stones. The vessels were ranged close alongside of each other, with their heads ashore, and their stern to the sea, the admiral's vessel being nearly in the centre. Besides the vessels of war, there were an hundred and seventy sail of smaller double canoes, all with a little house upon them, and rigged with mast and sail, which the war canoes had not. These, we judged, were designed for transport, victuallers, etc., for in the war canoes was no sort of provisions whatever. In these three hundred and thirty vessels, I guess there were no less than 7,760 men, a number which appears incredible, especially as we were told they all belonged to the districts of Atahoru and Ahopadia. In this computation I allow to each war canoe forty men, troops and rowers, and to each of the small canoes eight. Most of the gentlemen who were with me thought the number of men belonging to the war canoes exceeded this. It is certain that the most of them were fitted to row with more paddles than I have allowed them men, but at this time I think they were not complete. Tupia informed us, when I was first here, that the whole island raised only between six and seven thousand men, but we now saw two districts only raise that number, so that he must have taken his account from some old establishment or else he only meant tatatours, that is, warriors, or men trained from their infancy to arms, and did not include the rowers, and those necessary to navigate the other vessels. I should think he only spoke of this number as the standing troops or militia of the island, and not their whole force. This point I shall leave to be discussed in another place, and return to the subject. After we had well viewed this fleet, I wanted much to have seen the Admiral, to have gone with him on board the war canoes. We inquired for him as we rowed past the fleet to no purpose. We put ashore and inquired, but the noise and crowd was so great that no one attended to what we said. At last T came and whispered us in the ear that Otu was gone to Matavai, advising us to return thither and not to land where we were. We accordingly proceeded for the ship, and this intelligence and advice received from T gave rise to new conjectures. In short, we concluded this Tauha was some powerful disaffected chief who was upon the point of making war against his sovereign, for we could not imagine Otu had any other reason for leaving Opari in the manner he did. 
We had not been long gone from Opari before the whole fleet was in motion to the westward from whence it came. When we got to Matavai, our friends there told us that this fleet was part of the armament intended to go against Aimea, whose chief had thrown off the yoke of Otaheite and assumed an independency. We were likewise informed that Otu neither was nor had been at Matavai, so that we were still at a loss to know why he fled from Opari. This occasioned another trip thither in the afternoon, where we found him, and now understood that the reason of his not seeing me in the morning was, that some of his people having stolen a quantity of my clothes which were on shore washing, he was afraid I should demand restitution. He repeatedly asked me if I was not angry, and when I assured him that I was not, and that they might keep what they had got, he was satisfied. Toha was alarmed, partly on the same account. He thought I was displeased when I refused to go aboard his vessel, and I was jealous of seeing such a force in our neighbourhood, without being able to know anything of its design. Thus, by mistaking one another, I lost the opportunity of examining it more narrowly into part of the naval force of this isle, and making myself better acquainted with its manoeuvres. Such another opportunity may never occur, as it was commanded by a brave, sensible and intelligent chief, who would have satisfied us in all the questions we had thought proper to ask, and as the objects were before us, we could not well have misunderstood each other. It happened unluckily that Odidi was not with us in the morning, for T, who was the only man we could depend on, served only to perplex us. Matters being thus cleared up, and mutual presence having passed between Otu and me, we took leave and returned on board. End of Book Two, Chapter Eleven Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Chapter 12 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume 1 by James Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole Chapter 12 some account of a visit from Otu, Toha, and several other chiefs, also of a robbery committed by one of the natives and its consequences, with general observations on the subject. 1774 April In the morning of the 27th I received a present from Toha, consisting of two large hogs and some fruit, sent by two of his servants, who had orders not to receive anything in return, nor would they when offered them. Soon after I went down to Opari in my boat, where, having found both this chief and the king, after a short stay, I brought them on board to dinner, together with Tari Vatu, the king's younger brother, and T. As soon as we drew near the ship, the admiral, who had never seen one before, began to express much surprise at so new a sight. He was conducted all over the ship, every part of which he viewed with great attention. On this occasion O2 was the principal showman, for by this time he was well acquainted with the different parts of the ship. After dinner Toha put a hog on board and retired, without my knowing anything of the matter, or having made him any return, either for this, or the present I had in the morning. Soon after the king and his attendants went away also. O2 not only seemed to pay this chief much respect, but was desirous I should do the same, and yet he was jealous of him, but on what account we knew not. It was but the day before that he frankly told us Toha was not his friend, both these chiefs, when on board, solicited me to assist them against Tiarabu, 
notwithstanding a peace at this time subsisted between the two kingdoms, and we were told their joint force was to go against Yamiya. Whether this was done with a view to breaking with their neighbours and allies if I had promised them assistance, or only to sound my disposition, I know not. Probably they would have been ready enough to have embraced an opportunity, which would have enabled them to conquer that kingdom, and annex it to their own, as it formerly was. Be this as it may, I heard no more of it. Indeed, I gave them no encouragement. Next day we had a present of a hog sent by Wahiatua, king of Tiarabu. For this, in return, he desired a few red feathers which were, together with other things, sent him accordingly. Mr. Forster and his party set out for the mountains, with an intent to stay out all night. I did not go out of the ship this day. Early in the morning of the twenty-ninth, Otu Toha and several other grandees came on board, and brought with them as presents not only provisions, but some of the most valuable curiosities of the island. I made them returns with which they were well pleased. I likewise took this opportunity to repay the civilities I had received from Toha. The night before, one of the natives attempting to steal a water cask from the watering place, was caught in the act, sent on board and put in irons, in which situation Otu and the other chiefs saw him. Having made known his crime to them, Otu begged he might be set at liberty. This I refused, telling him that since I punish my people when they committed the least offence against his, it was but just this man should be punished also, and as I knew he would not do it, I was resolved to do it myself. Accordingly, I ordered the man to be carried on shore to the tents, and having followed myself with Otu, Toha, and others, I ordered the guard out under arms, and the man to be tied up to a post. Otu, his sister, and some others begged hard for him. Toha said not one word, but was very attentive to everything going forward. I expostulated with Otu on the conduct of this man, and half his people in general, telling him that neither I, nor any of my people, took anything from them, without first paying for it, enumerating the articles we gave in exchange for such and such things, and urging that it was wrong in them to steal from us, who were their friends. I moreover told him, that the punishing this man would be the means of saving the lives of others of his people, by deterring them for committing crimes of this nature, in which some would certainly be shot dead one time or another. With these and other arguments, which I believe he pretty well understood, he seemed satisfied, and only desired the man might not be mataru or killed, I then ordered the crowd, which was very great, to be kept at a proper distance, and in the presence of them all, ordered the fellow two dozen lashes with a cat o' nine tails, which he bore with great firmness, and was then set at liberty. After this the natives were going away, but Toha stepped forth, called them back, and harangued them for near half an hour. His speech consisted of short sentences, very little of which I understood, but from what we could gather, he recapitulated part of what I had said to Otu, named several advantages they had received from us, condemned their present conduct, and recommended a different one for the future. The gracefulness of his action, and the attention with which he was heard, bespoke him a great orator. Otu said not one word. As soon as Toha had ended his speech, I ordered the marines to go through their exercise, and to load and fire in volleys with ball, and as they were very quick in their manoeuvres, 
it is easier to conceive than to describe the amazement the natives were under the whole time especially those who had not seen anything of the kind before this being over the chiefs took leave and retired with all their attendants scarcely more pleased than frightened at what they had seen in the evening mr forster and his party returned from the mountains where he had spent the night having found some new plants and some others which grew in new zealand he saw wahene which lies forty leagues to the westward by which a judgment may be formed of the height of the mountains in otaheite next morning i had an opportunity to see the people of ten war canoes go through part of their paddling exercise they had put off from the shore before i was apprised of it so that i was only present at their landing they were properly equipped for war the warriors with their arms and dressed in their war habits etc in landing i observed that the moment the canoe touched the ground all the rowers leaped out and with the assistance of a few people on the shore dragged the canoe on dry land to her proper place which being done every one walked off with his paddle etc all this was executed with such expedition that in five minutes time after putting ashore you could not tell that any thing of the kind had been going forward I thought these vessels were thinly manned with rowers, the most being not above thirty, and the least sixteen or eighteen. I observed the warriors on the stage encourage the rowers to exert themselves. Some youths set high up in the curved stern, above the steersmen, with white wands in their hands. I know not what they were placed there for, unless it was to look out and direct, or give notice of what they saw as they were elevated above every one else. Tarivatu, the king's brother, gave me the first notice of these canoes being at sea, and knowing that Mr. Hodges made drawings of everything curious, desired of his own accord that he might be sent for. I being at this time on shore with Tarivatu, Mr. Hodges was therefore with me, and had an opportunity to collect some materials for a large drawing or picture of the fleet assembled at Opari, which conveys a far better idea of it than can be expressed by words. Being present when the warriors undressed, I was surprised at the quantity and weight of cloth they had upon them, not conceiving how it was possible for them to stand under it in time of battle. Not a little was wrapped round their heads as a turban, and made into a cap. This indeed might be necessary in preventing a broken head. Many had, fixed to one of this sort of caps, dried branches of small shrubs, covered over with white feathers, which, however, could only be for ornament. 1774 May on the first of may i had a very great supply of provisions sent and brought by different chiefs and the next day received a present from toha sent by his servants consisting of a hog and a boatload of various sorts of fruits and roots the like present i also had from otu bought by tarivatu who stayed dinner after which i went down to opari paid a visit to Otu, and returned on board in the evening. On the third, in looking into the conditions of our sea provisions, we found that the biscuit was in a state of decay, and that the airing and picking we had given it at New Zealand had not been of that service we expected and intended, so that we were obliged to take it all on shore here, where it underwent another airing and cleaning, in which a good deal was found wholly rotten and unfit to be eaten. We could not well account for this decay in our bread, especially as it was packed in good casks and stowed in a dry part of the hold. We judged it was owing to the ice we so frequently took in, 
when to the southward, which made the hold damp and cold, and to the great heat which succeeded when to the north. Be it this or any other cause, the loss was the same to us. It put us to a scanty allowance of this article, and we had bad bread to eat too. On the fourth, nothing worthy of note. On the fifth, the king and several other great men paid us a visit, and brought with them, as usual, some hogs and fruit. In the afternoon, the botanists set out for the mountains, and returned the following evening, having made some new discoveries in their way. On going ashore in the morning of the 7th, I found Otu at the tents, and took the opportunity to ask his leave to cut down some trees for fuel. He not well understanding me, I took him to some growing near the seashore, where I presently made him comprehend what I wanted, and he as readily gave his consent. I told him, at the same time, that I should cut down no trees that bore any fruit. He was pleased with this declaration, and told it aloud several times to the people about us. In the afternoon this chief and the whole of the royal family, viz. his father, brother, and three sisters, paid us a visit on board. This was properly his father's visit of ceremony. He brought me, as a present, a complete mourning dress, a curiosity we most valued. In return I gave him whatever he desired, which was not a little, and having distributed red feathers to all the others, conducted them ashore in my boat. Otu was so well pleased with the reception he and his friends met with, that he told me at parting, I might cut down as many trees as I pleased, and what sort I pleased. During the night between the 7th and 8th, some time in the middle watch, all our friendly connections received an interruption through the negligence of one of the sentinels on shore. He, having either slept or quitted his post, gave one of the natives an opportunity to carry off his musket. The first news I heard of it was from T, whom Otu had sent on board for that purpose, and to desire that I would go to him, for that he was Matau Ued. We were not well enough acquainted with their language to understand all T's story, but we understood enough to know that something had happened which had alarmed the king. In order, therefore, to be fully informed, I went ashore with T and Antarevatu, who had slept aboard all night. As soon as we landed, I was informed of the whole by the sergeant who commanded the party. I found the natives all alarmed, and the most of them fled. Tarivatu slipped from me in a moment, and hardly any remained by me but T. With him I went to look for Otu, and as we advanced I endeavoured to allay the fears of the people, but at the same time insisted on the musket being restored. After travelling some distance into the country, inquiring of every one we saw for Otu, T stopped all at once and advised me to return, saying that Otu was gone to the mountains, and he would proceed and tell him that I was still his friend. A question which had been asked me fifty times by different people, and if I was angry, etc. T also promised that he would use his endeavours to recover the musket. I was now satisfied it was to no purpose to go farther, for although I was alone and unarmed, Otu's fears were such that he durst not see me, and therefore I took T's advice and returned aboard. After this I sent Oedidi to Otu to let him know that his fears were ill-grounded, for that I only required the return of the musket, which I knew was in his power. Soon after OEDD was gone, we observed six large canoes coming round Point Venus. Some people whom I had sent out to watch the conduct of the neighbouring inhabitants informed me they were laden with baggage, fruit, hogs, etc. There being room for suspecting that some person belonging to these canoes had committed the theft, 
I presently came to a resolution to intercept them, and having put off in a boat for that purpose, gave orders for another to follow. One of the canoes, which was some distance ahead of the rest, came directly for the ship. I went alongside this, and found two or three women in her whom I knew. They told me they were going on board the ship with something for me, and on my inquiring of them for Otu, was told he was then at the tents. Pleased with this news, I contradicted the orders I had given for intercepting the other canoes, thinking they might be kept coming on board also, as well as this one, which I left within a few yards of the ship, and rowed ashore to speak with Otu. But when I landed I was told that he had not been there, nor knew they anything of him. On my looking behind me, I saw all the canoes making off in the greatest haste. Even the one I had left alongside the ship had evaded going on board, and was making her escape. Vexed at being thus outwitted, I resolved to pursue them, and as I passed the ship, gave orders to send another boat for the same purpose. Five out of six we took, and brought alongside. But the first, which acted the finesse so well, got clear off. When we got on board with our prizes, I learnt that the people who had deceived me used no endeavours to lay hold of the ship on the side they were up on, but let their canoe drop past, as if they meant to come under the stern or on the other side, and that the moment they were past they paddled off with all speed. Thus the canoe, in which there were only a few women, was to have amused us with four stories as they actually did, while the others, in which were most of the effects, got off. In one of the canoes we had taken was a chief, a friend of Mr. Forster's, who had hitherto called himself an Eare, and would have been much offended if any one had called his title in question. Also three women, his wife and daughter, and the mother of the late Tuataha. These, together with the canoes, I resolved to detain, and to send the chief to Otu, thinking he would have weight enough with him to obtain the return of the musket, as his own property was at stake. He was, however, very unwilling to go on this embassy, and made various excuses, one of which was his being of too low a rank for this honourable employment, saying he was no iri, but a matahauna, and therefore was not a fit person to be sent, that an iri ought to be sent to speak to an iri, and as there was no iris but Otu and myself, it would be much more proper for me to go. All his arguments would have availed him little, if T and Odidi had not at this time come on board, and given a new turn to the affair, by declaring that the man who stole the musket was from Tiarabu, and had gone with it to that kingdom, so that it was not in the power of Otu to recover it. I very much doubted their veracity, till they asked me to send a boat to Wahiatua, the king of Tiarabu, and offered to go themselves in her, and get it. I asked why this could not be done without my sending a boat. They said it would not otherwise be given to them. This story of theirs, although it did not quite satisfy me, nevertheless carried with it a probability of truth, for which reason I thought it better to drop the affair altogether, rather than to punish a nation for a crime I was not sure any of its members had committed. I therefore suffered my new ambassador to depart with his two canoes without executing his commission. The other three canoes belonged to Taritata, a Tiarabu chief, who had been some days about the tents, and there was good reason to believe it was one of his people that carried off the musket. I intended to have detained them, but as T and Odidi both assured me that Maritata and his people were quite innocent, 
I suffered them to be taken away also, and desired T to tell Otoo that I should give myself no farther concern about the musket, since I was satisfied none of his people had stolen it. Indeed, I thought it was irrecoverably lost, but in the dusk of the evening it was brought to the tents, together with some other things we had lost, which we knew nothing of, by three men who had pursued the thief and taken them from him. I know not if they took this trouble of their own accord or by the order of Otu. I rewarded them and made no other inquiry about it. These men, as well as some others present, assured me that it was one of Maritata's people who had committed this theft, which vexed me that I had let his canoes so easily slip through my fingers. Here, I believe, both T and Oedidi designedly deceived me. When the musket and other things were brought in, every one then present, or who came after, pretended to have had some hand in recovering them, and claimed a reward accordingly. But there was no one who acted this farce so well as Nuno, a man of some note, and well known to us when I was here in 1769. This man came, with all the savage fury imaginable in his countenance, and a large club in his hand, with which he beat about him, in order to show us how he alone had killed the thief, when at the same time we all knew that he had not been out of his house the whole time. Thus ended this troublesome day, and next morning early, T, Otoo's faithful ambassador, came again on board to acquaint me that Otoo was gone to Opari, and desired I would send a person, one of the natives as I understood, to tell him that he, I was still his Tio, I asked him why he did not do this himself, as I had desired. He made some excuse, but I believe the truth was he had not seen him. In short, I found it was necessary for me to go myself, for, while we thus spent our time in messages, we remained without fruit, a stop being put to all exchanges of this nature, that is, the natives brought nothing to market. Accordingly, a party of us set out with tea in our company, and proceeded to the very utmost limits of Opari, where, after waiting some considerable time, and several messages having passed, the king at last made his appearance. After we were seated under the shade of some trees as usual, and the first salutations were over, he desired me to paru, that is, to speak, Accordingly, I began with blaming him for being frightened and alarmed at what had happened, since I had always professed myself his friend, and I was not angry with him or any of his people, but with those of Tiarabu, who were the thieves. I was then asked how I came to fire at the canoes. Chance on this occasion furnished me with a good excuse. I told them, that they belonged to Maritata, a Tiarabu man, one of whose people had stolen the musket, and occasioned all this disturbance, and if I had them in my power, I would destroy them, or any other belonging to Tiarabu. This declaration pleased them, as I expected, from the natural aversion the one kingdom has to the other. What I said was enforced by presence, which perhaps had the greatest weight with them. Thus were things once more restored to their former state, and Otoo promised on his part that the next day we should be supplied with fruit, etc., as usual. We then returned with him to his proper residence at Opari, and there took a view of some of the dockyards, for such they well deserve to be called, and large canoes, some lately built and others building, two of which were the largest I had ever seen in this sea, or indeed anywhere else under that name. This done, we returned on board with T and our company, who, after he had dined with us, went to inform old Happy, the king's father, that all matters were again accommodated. 
This old chief was at this time in the neighbourhood of Matavai, and it should seem, from what followed, that he was not pleased with the conditions, for the same evening all the women, which were not a few, were sent for out of the ship, and people stationed on different parts of the shore, to prevent any from coming off, and the next morning no supplies whatever being brought. On my inquiring into the reason, I was told happy, Mata Aud. Chagrin at this disappointment, as I was, I forbore taking any step, from a supposition that T had not seen him, or that Otu's orders had not yet reached Matavai. A supply of fruit sent us from Opari, and some brought us by our friends, served us for the present, and made us less anxious about it. Thus matters stood till the afternoon, when Otu himself came to the tents with a large supply. Thither I went and expostulated him for not permitting the people in our neighbourhood to bring us fruit as usual, insisting on his giving immediate orders about it, which he either did or had done before, for presently after, more was brought us than we could well manage. This was not to be wondered at, for the people had everything in readiness to bring, the moment they were permitted, and I believe thought themselves as much injured by the restriction as we did. O2 desiring to see some of the great guns fire from the ship, I ordered twelve to be shotted and fired towards the sea. As he had never seen a cannon fired before, the sight gave him as much pain as pleasure. In the evening we entertained him with fireworks, which gave him great satisfaction. Thus ended all our differences, on which I beg leave to suggest the following remarks. I have had occasion before in this journal to observe that these people were continually watching opportunities to rob us. This their governors either encouraged, or had not power to prevent but most probably the former, because the offender was always screened. That they should commit such daring thefts was the more extraordinary, as they frequently run the risk of being shot in the attempt, and if the article that they stole was of any consequence, they knew they should be obliged to make restitution. The moment a theft of this kind was committed, it spread like a wind over the whole neighbourhood, they judged of the consequences from what they had got. If it were a trifle, and such an article as we usually gave them, little or no notice was taken of it. But if the contrary, every one took the alarm, and moved off with his movables in all haste. The chief then was Mata Aued, giving orders to bring us no supplies, and flying to some distant part. All this was sometimes done so suddenly, that we obtained, by these appearances, the first intelligence of our being robbed. Whether we oblige them to make restitution or no, the chief must be reconciled before any of the people were permitted to bring in refreshments. They knew very well we could not do without them, and therefore they never failed strictly to observe this rule, without ever considering that all their war-canoes, on which the strength of their nation depends, their houses, and even the very fruit they refused to supply us with, were entirely in our power. It is hard to say how they would act, were one to destroy any of these things. Except the detaining some of their canoes for a while, I never touched the least article of their property. Of the two extremes I always chose that which appeared the most equitable and mild. A trifling present to the chief always succeeded to my wish, and very often put things upon a better footing than they had been before. That they were the first aggressors had very little influence on my conduct in this respect, because no difference happened but when it was so. My people very rarely or never broke through the rules I thought it necessary to prescribe. Had I observed a different conduct, I must have been a loser by it in the end, and all I could expect, after destroying some part of their property, 
would have been the empty honour of obliging them to make the first overture towards an accommodation. But who knows if this would have been the event? Three things made them our fast friends. Their own good nature and benevolent disposition, gentle treatment on our part, and the dread of our firearms. By our ceasing to observe the second, the first would have worn out of course, and the too frequent use of the latter would have excited a spirit of revenge, and perhaps have taught them that firearms were not such terrible things as they had imagined. They were very sensible of the superiority of their numbers, and no one knows what an enraged multitude might do. End of Book 2, Chapter 12 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Chapter 13 of Volume 1 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume 1 by James Cook this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter 13. Preparations to leave the island. Another naval review and various other incidents. With some account of the island, its naval force and number of inhabitants. 1774 May. In the morning of the 11th, a very large supply of fruit was brought us from all parts. Some of it came from Toha, the admiral, sent as usual by his servants, with orders to receive nothing in return. But he desired I would go and see him at Atahuru, as he was ill and could not come to me. As I could not well undertake this journey, I sent Oedidi along with Toha's servants, with a present suitable to that which I had in so genteel a manner, received from him. As the most essential repairs of the ship were nearly finished, I resolved to leave Otaheite in a few days, and accordingly ordered everything to be got off from the shore, that the natives might see we were about to depart. On the twelfth, old Oberia, the woman who, when the dolphin was here in 1767, was thought to be queen of the island, and whom I had not seen since 1769, paid us a visit, and brought a present of hogs and fruit. Soon after came Otu with a great retinue, and a large quantity of provisions. I was pretty liberal in my returns, thinking it might be the last time I should see these good people, who had so liberally relieved our wants, and in the evening entertain them with fireworks. On the 13th, wind easterly fair weather. Nevertheless, we were not ready to sail, as Otu had made me promise to see him again, and I had a present to make him, which I reserved to the last. Oedidi was not yet come back from Atahuru. Various reports arose concerning him. Some said he had returned to Matavai, others that he would not return, and some would have it that he was at Opari. In order to know more of the truth, a party of us in the evening went down to Opari, where we found him and likewise Toha, who, notwithstanding his illness, had resolved to see me before I sailed, and had got thus far on his journey. He was afflicted with a swelling in his feet and legs, which had entirely taken away the use of them. As the day was far spent, we were obliged to shorten our stay, and after seeing Otu, we returned with Oedidi on board. This youth, I found, was desirous of remaining at this isle, having before told him, as likewise many others, that we should not return. I now mentioned to him, that he was at liberty to remain here, or to quit us at Ulitea, or to go with us to England, frankly owning that, if he chose the latter, it was very probable 
he would never return to this country, in which case I would take care of him, and he must afterwards look upon me as his father. He threw his arms about me and wept much, saying many people persuaded him to remain at Otaheite. I told him to go ashore and speak to his friends, and then come to me in the morning. He was well beloved in the ship, so that every one was persuading him to go with us, telling what great things he would see in England, and the immense riches, according to his idea of riches, he would return with. But I thought it proper to undeceive him, as knowing that the only inducement of his going was the expectation of returning, and I could see no prospect of an opportunity of that kind happening, unless a ship should be expressly sent out for that purpose, which neither I nor any one else had a right to expect. I thought it an act of the highest injustice to take a person from these isles under any promise which was not in my power to perform. At this time, indeed, it was quite unnecessary, for many youths voluntarily offered themselves to go, and even to remain and die in Pretani, as they call our country. Otu importuned me much to take one or two to collect red feathers for him at Amsterdam, willing to risk the chance of their returning. Some of the gentlemen on board were likewise desirous of taking some as servants, but I refused every solicitation of this kind, knowing from experience they would be of no use to us in the course of the voyage, and further my views were not extended. What had the greatest weight with me was, the thinking myself bound to see they were afterwards properly taken care of, as they could not be carried from their native spot without consent. Next morning early, OEDD came on board, with a resolution to remain on the island. But Mr. Forster prevailed upon him to go with us to Ulitea. Soon after, Toha, Patatu, Oamu, Happy, Oberea, and several more of our friends came on board with fruit, etc. Toha was hoisted in and placed on a chair on the quarter-deck. His wife was with him. Amongst the various articles which I gave this chief was an English pendant, which pleased him more than all the rest, especially after he had been instructed in the use of it. We had no sooner dispatched our friends than we saw a number of war canoes coming round the point of Opari. Being desirous of having a nearer view of them, accompanied by some of the officers and gentlemen, I hastened down to Opari, which we reached before all the canoes were landed and had an opportunity of seeing in what manner they approached the shore. When they got before the place where they intended to land, they formed themselves into divisions, consisting of three or four, or perhaps more, lashed square and close alongside of each other, and then each division, one after the other, paddled in for the shore with all their might, and conducted in so judicious a manner that they formed and closed a line along the shore to an inch. The rowers were encouraged to exert their strength by their leaders on the stages, and directed by a man who stood with a wand in his hand, in the forepart of the middlemost vessel. This man, by words and actions, directed the paddlers when all should paddle, when either the one side or the other should cease, etc., for the steering paddles alone were not sufficient to direct them. All these motions they observed with such quickness as clearly showed them to be expert in their business. After Mr. Hodges had made a drawing of them, as they lay ranged along the shore, we landed and took a nearer view of them by going on board several. This fleet consisted of forty sail, equipped in the same manner as those we had seen before, belonged to the small district of Tetaha, and were come to Opari to be reviewed before the king, as the former fleet had been. 
there were attending on his fleet some small double canoes which they called marais having on their forepart a kind of double bed place laid over with green leaves each just sufficient to hold one man these they told us were to lay their dead upon their chiefs i suppose they meant otherwise their slain must be few o two who was present caused at my request some of their troops to go through their exercise on shore two parties first began with clubs but this was over almost as soon as begun so that i had no time to make my observations upon it they then went to single combat and exhibited the various methods of fighting with great alertness parrying off the blows and pushes which each combatant aimed at the other with great dexterity their arms were clubs and spears the latter they also use as darts in fighting with the club all blows intended to be given the legs were evaded by leaping over it and those intended for the head by crouching a little and leaping on one side thus the blow would fall to the ground the spear or dart was parried by fixing the point of a spear on the ground right before them holding it in an inclined position more or less elevated according to the part of the body they saw their antagonist intending to make a push or throw his dart at and by moving the hand a little to the right or left either the one or the other was turned off with great ease i thought that when one combatant had parried off the blows etc of the other he did not use the advantage which seemed to me to accrue as for instance after he had parried off a dart he still stood on the defensive and suffered his antagonist to take up another when i thought there was time to run him through the body these combatants had no superfluous dress upon them and a necessary piece of cloth or two which they had on when they began were presently torn off by the bystanders and given to some of the gentlemen present this being over the fleet departed not in any order but as fast as they could be got afloat and we went with o two to one of his dockyards where the two large pahis or canoes were building each of which was an hundred and eight feet long they were almost ready to launch and were intended to make one joint double pahi or canoe the king begged of me a grappling and rope to which i added an english jack and pendant with the use of which he was well acquainted and desired the pahi might be called britannia this he very readily agreed to and she was named accordingly after this he gave me a hog and a turtle of about sixty pounds weight which was put privately into our boat the giving it away not being agreeable to some of the great lords about him who were thus deprived of a feast he likewise would have given me a large shark they had prisoner in a creek some of his fins being cut off so that he could not make his escape but the fine pork and fish we had got at this isle had spoiled our palates for such food the king and tea his prime minister accompanied us on board to dinner and after it was over took a most affectionate farewell he hardly ever ceased soliciting me this day to return to otaheite and just before he went out of the ship took a youth by the hand and presented him to me desiring i would keep him on board to go to amsterdam to collect red feathers i told him i could not since i knew he would never return but that if any ship should happen to come from britain to this isle i would either bring or send him red feathers in abundance this in some measure satisfied him but the youth was exceedingly desirous of going and if I had not come to a resolution to carry no one from the isles except Oedidi if he chose to go, and but just refused Mr. Forster the liberty of taking a boy, 
I believe I should have consented. O2 remained alongside in his canoe till we were under sail, when we put off and saluted with three guns. Our treatment here was such as had induced one of our gunner's mates to form a plan to remain at this isle. He knew he could not execute it with success while we lay in the bay, therefore took the opportunity, as soon as we were out, the boats in and sail set, to slip overboard being a good swimmer. But he was discovered before he got clear of the ship, and we presently hoisted a boat out and took him up. A canoe was observed about half-way between us and the shore, seemingly coming after us. She was intended to take him up, but as soon as the people in her saw our boat, they kept at a distance. This was a preconcerted plan between the man and them, which Otu was acquainted with and had encouraged. When I considered this man's situation in life, I did not think him so culpable, nor the resolution he had taken of staying here so extraordinary, as it may at first appear. He was an Irishman by birth, and had sailed in the Dutch service. I picked him up at Batavia on my return from my former voyage, and he had been with me ever since. I never learnt that he had either friends or connections to confine him to any particular part of the world. All nations were alike to him. Where, then, could such a man be more happy than at one of these isles, where, in one of the finest climates in the world, he could enjoy not only the necessaries, but the luxuries of life, in ease and plenty? I know not if he might have not have obtained my consent, if he had applied for it in a proper time. As soon as we had got him on board and the boat in, I steered for Wahene, in order to pay a visit to our friends there. But before we leave Otaheite, it will be necessary to give some account of the present state of that island, especially as it differs very much from what it was eight months before. I have already mentioned the improvements we found in the plains of Opari and Matavai. The same was observable in every other part into which we came. It seemed to us almost incredible that so many large canoes and houses could be built in so short a time as eight months. The iron tools which they had got from the English, and other nations who have lately touched at the isle, had no doubt greatly accelerated the work, and they had no want of hands, as I shall soon make appear. The number of hogs was another thing that excited our wonder. Probably they were not so scarce when we were here before as we imagined, and at not choosing to part with any, they had conveyed them out of our sight. Be this as it may, we now not only got as many as we could consume during our stay, but some to take to sea with us. When I was last here, I conceived but an unfavourable opinion of O2's talents. The improvements since made in the island convinced me of my mistake, and he must have been a man of good parts. He had indeed some judicious, sensible men about him, who, I believe, had a great share in the government. In truth, we know not how far his power extended as king, nor how far he could command the assistance of the other chiefs, or was controllable by them. It would seem, however, that all had contributed towards bringing the isle to its present flourishing state. We cannot doubt that there were divisions amongst the great men of this state, as well as of most others. For else why did the king tell us that Toha the admiral and Poatatu were not his friends? They were two leading chiefs, and he must have been jealous of them on account of their great power, for on every occasion he seemed to court their interest. We had reason to believe that they raised by far the greatest number of vessels and men to go against Iamia, and were to be two of the commanders in the expedition, which we were told was to take place five days after our departure. Wahiatua, king of Tiarabu, 
was to send a fleet to join that of Otoo, to assist him in reducing to obedience the chief of Iamia. I think we were told that that young prince was one of the commanders. One would suppose that so small an island as Iamia would hardly have attempted to make head against the united force of these two kingdoms, but have endeavoured to settle matters by negotiation. Yet we heard of no such thing. On the contrary, every one spoke of nothing but fighting. Toha told us more than once that he should die there, which in some measure shows that he thought of it. Oedidi told me the battle would be fought at sea, in which case the other must have a fleet nearly equal, if not quite, to the one going against them, which I think was not probable. It was therefore more likely they would remain ashore upon the defensive, as we were told they did about five or six years ago, when attacked by the people of Tiarabu, whom they repulsed. Five general officers were to command in this expedition, of which number O2 was one, and if they named them in order according to the post they held, O2 was only the third in command. This seems probable enough, as being but a young man, he could not have sufficient experience to command such an expedition, where the greatest skill and judgment seem to be necessary. I confess I would willingly have stayed five days longer, had I been sure the expedition would have then taken place but it rather seemed that they wanted us to be gone first. We had been all along told it would be ten moons before it took place, and it was not till the evening before we sailed that Otoo and Toha told us it was to be five days after we were gone, as it was necessary to have that time to put everything in order, for, while we lay there, great part of their time and attention was taken up with us. I had observed that for several days before we sailed, O2 and the other chiefs had ceased to solicit my assistance, as they were continually doing it first, till I assured O2 that, if they got their fleet ready in time, I would sail with them down to Iamia. After this I heard no more of it. They probably had taken it into consideration, and concluded themselves safer without me, well knowing it would be in my power to give the victory to whom I pleased, and that, at the best, I might thwart some favourite custom, or run away with the spoils. But be their reasons what they might, they certainly wanted us to be gone, before they undertook anything. Thus we were deprived of seeing the whole fleet equipped on this occasion, and perhaps of being spectators of a sea-fight, and by that means, gaining some knowledge of their manoeuvres. I never could learn what number of vessels were to go on this expedition. We knew of no more than 210, besides smaller canoes to serve as transports, etc., and the fleet of Tiarabu, the strength of which we never learned. Nor could I ever learn the number of men necessary to man this fleet, and whenever I asked the question, the answer was waru 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 te tata, that is, many, many, many men, as if the number far exceeded their arithmetic. If we allow forty men to each war canoe, and four to each of the others, which is thought a moderate computation, the number will amount to nine thousand, an astonishing number to be raised in four districts, and one of them, viz. Batavia, did not equip a fourth part of its fleet. The fleet of Tiarabu is not included in this account, and many other districts might be arming, which we knew nothing of. I, however, believe that the whole isle did not arm on this occasion, for we saw not the least preparations making in Opari. From what we saw and could learn, I am clearly of opinion that the chief or chiefs of each district superintended the equipping of the fleet belonging to that district, but after they are equipped they must pass in review before the king, and be approved of by him, 
By this means he knows the state of the whole, before they assemble to go on service. It hath been already observed that the number of war canoes belonging to Atahuru and Oapata was a hundred and sixty, to Tataba forty, and to Matavia ten, and that this district did not equip one-fourth part of their number. If we suppose every district in the island, of which there are forty-three, to raise and equip the same number of war canoes as Tetaha, we shall find by this estimate that the whole island can raise and equip one thousand seven hundred and twenty war canoes and sixty-eight thousand able men, allowing forty men to each canoe. And as these cannot amount to above one-third part of the number of both sexes, children included, the whole island cannot contain less than two hundred and four thousand inhabitants, a number which at first sight exceeded my belief. But when I came to reflect on the vast swarms which appeared wherever we came, I was convinced that estimate was not much, if at all, too great. There cannot be a greater proof of the riches and fertility of Otaheite, not forty leagues in circuit, than its supporting such a number of inhabitants. This island made formerly but one kingdom. How long it has been divided into two, I cannot pretend to say, but I believe not long. The kings of Tiarabu are a branch of the family of those of Opurionu. At present the two are nearly related, and I think the former is in some measure dependent on the latter. Otu is styled Iri de Hie of the whole island, and we have been told that Wahitua, the king of Tiarabu, must uncover before him, in the same manner as the meanest of his subjects. This homage is due to Otu as Iri de Hie of the island, to Tarivatu, his brother, and his second sister, to the one as heir and to the other as heir apparent. His oldest sister being married is not entitled to this homage. The Iowas and Wanos we have sometimes seen covered before the king, but whether by courtesy or by virtue of their office we never could learn. These men who are the principal persons about the king, and form his court, are generally, if not always, his relations. T, whom I have so often mentioned, was one of them. We have been told that the Iowas, who have the first rank, attend in their turns a certain number each day, which occasioned us to call them lords-in-waiting. But whether this was really so, I cannot say. We seldom found T absent. Indeed, his attendance was necessary, as being best able to negotiate matters between us and them, on which service he was always employed, and he executed it, I have reason to believe, to the satisfaction of both parties. It is to be regretted that we know little more of this government than the general outline, for of its subdivisions, classes, or orders of the constituent parts, how disposed or in what manner connected, so as to form one body politic, we know but little. We are sure, however, that it is of the feudal sort, and if we may judge from what we have seen, it has sufficient stability, and is by no means badly constructed. The Eowas and Wanos always eat with the king. Indeed, I do not know if any one is excluded from this privilege, but the Tutus, for as to the women, they are out of the question, as they never eat with the men, let their rank be ever so much elevated. Notwithstanding this kind of kingly establishment, there was very little about Otu's person or court, by which a stranger could distinguish the king from the subject. I seldom saw him dressed in anything but a common piece of cloth wrapped round his loins so that he seemed to avoid all the necessary pomp, and even to demean himself more than any other of the Eries. I have seen him work at a paddle, in coming to and going from the ship, in common with the other paddlers, 
and even when some of his tutus sat looking on. All have free access to him, and speak to him wherever they see him, without the least ceremony. Such is the easy freedom which every individual of this happy isle enjoys. I have observed that the chiefs of these isles are more beloved by the bulk of the people than feared. May we not from hence conclude that the government is mild and equitable? We have mentioned Wahiatua, or Tiarabu, is related to Otu. The same may be said of the chiefs of Iamia, Tapamanu, Wahene, Olitea, Otaha, and Bolabola, for they are all related to the royal family of Otaheite. It is a maxim with the Eries, and others of superior rank, never to intermarry with the Tutus, or others of inferior rank. Probably this custom is one great inducement to the establishing of the societies called Irioes. It is certain that these societies greatly prevent the increase of the superior classes of people of which they are composed, and do not at all interfere with the inferiors or tutus, for I never heard of one of these being an Irioi, nor did I ever hear that a tutu could rise in life above the rank in which he was born. I have occasionally mentioned the extraordinary fondness the people of Otaheite showed for red feathers. These they called Ura, and they are as valuable here as jewels are in Europe, especially those which they call Urabine, and grow on the head of the green paraquet. Indeed, all red feathers are esteemed, but none equally with these, and they are such good judges as to know very well how to distinguish one sort from another. Many of our people attempted to deceive them by dyeing other feathers, but I never heard that any one succeeded. These feathers they make up in little bunches, consisting of eight or ten, and fix them to the end of a small cord, about three or four inches long, which is made of the strong outside fibres of the coconut, twisted so hard that it is like a wire, and serves as a handle to the bunch. Thus prepared, they are used as symbols of the Iatuas, or divinities, in all their religious ceremonies. I have often seen them hold one of these bunches, and sometimes only two or three feathers, between the forefinger and thumb, and say a prayer, not one word of which I could ever understand. Whoever comes to this island will do well to provide himself with red feathers, the finest and smallest there are to be got. He must also have a good stock of axes and hatchets, spike nails, files, knives, looking-glasses, beads, etc. Sheets and shirts are much sought after, especially by the ladies, as many of our gentlemen found by experience. The two goats which Captain Furneaux gave to Otu when we were last here seem to promise fair for answering the end for which they were put on shore. The ewe soon after had two female kids, which were now so far grown as to be nearly ready to propagate, and the old ewe was again with kid. The people seemed to be very fond of them, and they too liked their situation as well, for they were in excellent condition. From this circumstance we may hope that, in a few years, they will have some to spare to their neighbours and by that means they may in time spread over all the isles in this ocean. The sheep which we left died soon after, excepting one, which we understood was yet alive. We have also furnished them with a stock of cats, no less than twenty having been given away at this isle, besides those which were left at Olitea and Wahene. End of chapter 13 Recording by David Cole Medway, Massachusetts. Chapter 14 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole.
Chapter 14 The Arrival of the Ship at the Island of Hawene With an Account of an Expedition into the Island and Several Other Incidents Which Happened While She Lay There 1774 May At one o'clock in the afternoon on the 15th We anchored in the north entrance of Awara Harbour in the island of Huahene, hoisted out the boats, warped into a proper berth, and moored with a bower and kedge anchor, not quite a cable's length from the shore. While this was doing, several of the natives made us a visit, amongst whom was old Ori the chief, who brought a hog and some other articles, which he presented to me with the usual ceremony. Next morning the natives began to bring us fruit. I returned Ori's visit, and made my present to him, one article of which was red feathers. Two or three of these the chief took in his right hand, holding them up between the finger and thumb, and said a prayer, as I understood, which was little noticed by any present. Two hogs were soon after put into my boat, and he and several of his friends came on board and dined with us. After dinner, Ori gave me to understand what articles would be most acceptable to him and his friends, which were chiefly axes and nails. Accordingly, I gave him what he asked, and desired he would distribute them to the others, which he did, seemingly to the satisfaction of every one. A youth about ten or twelve years of age, either his son or grandson, seemed to be the person of most note, and had the greatest share. After the distribution was over, they all returned ashore, Mr. Forster and his party being out in the country botanizing, his servant, a feeble man, was beset by five or six fellows, who would have stripped him, if that moment one of the party had not come to his assistance, after which they made off with a hatchet they had got from him. On the 17th I went ashore to look for the chief, in order to complain of the outrage committed as above, but he was not in the neighbourhood. Being ashore in the afternoon, a person came and told me Ori wanted to see me. I went with the man, and was conducted to a large house, where the chief and several other persons of note were assembled in council, as well as I could understand. After I was seated and some conversation had passed among them, Ori made a speech and was answered by another. I understood no more of either than just to know it regarded the robbery committed the day before. The chief then began to assure me that neither he nor any one present, which were the principal chiefs in the neighborhood, had any hand in it, and desired me to kill with the guns all those which had. I assured him that I was satisfied that neither he nor those present were at all concerned in the affair, and that I should do with the fellows as he desired, or any others who were guilty of the like crimes. Having asked where the fellows were, and desired they would bring them to me, that I might do with them as he had said, his answer was they were gone to the mountains and he could not get them. Whether this was the case or not, I will not pretend to say. I knew fair means would never make them deliver them up, and I had no intention to try others. So the affair dropped, and the council broke up. In the evening some of the gentlemen went to a dramatic entertainment. The piece represented a girl as running away with us from Otaheite, which was in some degree true as a young woman had taken a passage with us down to Ulitea, and happened now to be present at the representation of her own adventures, which had such an effect upon her that it was with great difficulty our gentleman could prevail upon her to see the play out, or to refrain from tears while it was acting. The piece concluded with the reception she was supposed to meet with from her friends at her return, which was not a very favourable one. These people can add little extempore pieces to their entertainments, when they see occasion. Is it not then reasonable to suppose, 
that it was intended as a satire against this girl, and to discourage others from following her steps. In the morning of the 18th, Ori came on board with a present of fruit, stayed dinner, and in the afternoon desired to see some great guns fired, shotted, which I complied with. The reason of his making this request was his hearing from Oedidi and our Otaheitan passengers that we had so done at their island. The chief would have had us fire at the hills, but I did not approve of that, lest the shot should fall short and do some mischief. Besides, the effect was better seen in the water. Some of the petty officers, who had leave to go into the country for their amusement, took two of the natives with them to be their guides, and to carry their bags containing nails, hatchets, etc., the current cash we traded with here, which the fellows made off with in the following artful manner. The gentlemen had with them two muskets for shooting birds. After a shower of rain, their guides pointed out some for them to shoot, one of the muskets having missed fire several times, and the other having gone off. The instant the fellows saw themselves secure from both, they ran away, leaving the gentlemen gazing after them with so much surprise that no one had presence of mind to pursue them. The nineteenth, showery morning, fair afternoon, nothing happened worthy of note. Early in the morning of the twentieth, three of the officers set out on a shooting party, rather contrary to my inclination, as I found the natives, at least some of them, were continually watching every opportunity to rob straggling parties, and were daily growing more daring. About three o'clock in the afternoon I got intelligence that they were seized and stripped of everything they had about them. Upon this I immediately went on shore with a boat's crew, accompanied by Mr. Forster, and took possession of a large house with all its effects, and two chiefs whom I found in it, but this we did in such a manner that they hardly knew what we were about, being unwilling to alarm the neighbourhood. In this situation I remained till I heard the officers had got back safe, and had all their things restored to them. Then I quitted the house, and presently after everything in it was carried off. When I got on board I was informed of the whole affair by the officers themselves. Some little insult on their part induced the natives to seize their guns, on which a scuffle ensued, some chiefs interfered, took the officers out of the crowd, and caused everything which had been taken from them to be restored. This was at a place where we had before been told that a set of fellows had formed themselves into a gang with a resolution to rob every one who should go that way. It would seem from what followed that the chief could not prevent this or put a stop to these repeated outrages. I did not see him this evening as he was not come into the neighbourhood when I went on board but for I learned from Oedidi that he came soon after, and was so concerned at what had happened that he wept. Daylight no sooner broke upon us on the 21st than we saw upwards of sixty canoes under sail going out of the harbour, and steering over Ulitea. Upon our inquiring the reason, we were told that the people in them were i ari was and were going to visit their brethren in the neighbouring isles one might almost compare these men to Freemasons. They tell us they assist each other when need requires. They seem to have customs among them which they either will not or cannot explain. Oedidi told us he was one, Tupia was one, and yet I have not been able to get any tolerable idea of this set of men from either of them. Oedidi denies that the children they have by their mistresses are put to death, as we understand from Tupia and others. I have had some conversation with Omai on this subject, and find that he confirms everything that is said upon it in the narrative of my former voyage. Oedidi, who generally slept on shore, came off with a message from Ori 
desiring that I would land with twenty-two men to go with him to chastise the robbers. The messenger brought with him, by way of assisting his memory, twenty-two pieces of leaves, a method customary amongst them. On my receiving this extraordinary message, I went to the chief for better information, and all I could learn of him was that these fellows were a sort of banditti who had formed themselves into a body with the resolution of seizing and robbing our people wherever they found them, and were now armed for that purpose, for which reason he wanted me to go along with him to chastise them. I told him if I went they would fly to the mountains, but he said they were resolved to fight us, and therefore desired I would destroy both them and their house, but begged I would spare those in the neighbourhood, as also the canoes and the Winoa. By way of securing these, he presented me with a pig as a peace offering for the Winoa. It was too small to be meant for anything but a ceremony of this kind. This sensible old chief could see, what perhaps none of the others ever thought of, that everything in the neighbourhood was at our mercy, and therefore took care to secure them by this method, which I supposed to be of weight with them. When I returned on board I considered of the chief's request, which upon the whole appeared an extraordinary one. I, however, resolved to go, lest these fellows should be, by our refusal, encouraged to commit greater acts of violence and, as their proceeding would soon reach Ulitea, where I intended to go next, the people there might be induced to treat us in the same manner or worse, they being more numerous. Accordingly I landed with forty-eight men, including officers, Mr. Forster and some other of the gentlemen. The chief joined us with a few people, and we began to march in search of the banditti in good order. As we proceeded, the chief's party increased like a snowball. Oedidi, who was with us, began to be alarmed, observing that many of the people in our company were of the very party we were going against, and at last telling us that they were only leading us to some place where they could attack us to advantage. Whether there was any truth in this, or it was only Oedidi's fears, I will not pretend to say. He, however, was the only person we could confide in, and we regulated our motions according to the information he had given us. After marching some miles, we got intelligence that the men we were going after had fled to the mountains, but I think this was not till I had declared to the chief I would proceed no farther. For we were then about crossing a deep valley, bounded on each side by steep rocks, where a few men with stones only might have made our retreat difficult. If their intentions were what Oedidi had suggested, and which he still persisted in, having come to a resolution to return, we marched back in the same order as we went, and saw in several places people who had been following us, coming down from the sides of the hills with their arms in their hands, which they instantly quitted and hid in the bushes when they saw they were discovered by us. This seemed to prove that there must have been some foundation for what Oedidi had said, but I cannot believe that the chief had any such design, whatever the people might have. In our return we halted at a convenient place to refresh ourselves. I ordered the people to bring us some coconuts, which they did immediately. Indeed, by this time, I believe many of them wished us on board out of the way, for although no one step was taken that could give them the least alarm, they certainly were in terror. Two chiefs brought each of them a pig, a dog, and some young plantain trees, the usual peace offerings, and with due ceremony presented them singly to us. Another brought a very large hog, with which he followed us to the ship. After this we continued our course to the landing-place, where I caused several volleys to be fired, 
to convince the natives that we could support a continual fire. This being done, we all embarked and went on board, and soon after the chief following, brought with him a quantity of fruit, and sat down with us to dinner. We had scarce dined before more fruit was brought us by others, and two hogs, so that we were likely to make more by this little excursion than by all the presents we had made them. It certainly gave them some alarm to see so strong a party of men march into their country, and probably gave them a better opinion of firearms than they had before. For I believe they had but an indifferent, or rather contemptible, idea of muskets in general, having never seen any fired but at birds, etc., by such of our people as used to straggle about the country, the most of them but indifferent marksmen, losing generally two shots out of three, their pieces often missing fire, and being slow in charging. Of this they had taken great notice, and concluded, as well they might, that firearms were not so terrible things as they had been taught to believe. When the chiefs took leave in the evening, they promised to bring us next day a very large supply of provisions. In the article of fruit they were as good as their word, but of hogs which we most wanted, they brought far less than we expected. Going ashore in the afternoon, I found the chief just sitting down to dinner. I cannot say what was the occasion of his dining so late. As soon as he was seated, Several people began chewing the pepper root, about a pint of the juice of which, without any mixture, was the first dish, and was dispatched in a moment. A cup of it was presented to me, but the manner of brewing it was at this time sufficient. Oedidi was not so nice, but took what I refused. After this the chief washed his mouth with coconut water, then he ate of repe, plantain, and mahi, of each not a little, and lastly finished his repast by eating, or rather drinking, about three pints of popoye, which is made of breadfruit, plantains, mahi, etc., beat together and diluted with water, till it is of the consistence of a custard. This was at the outside of his house in the open air, for at this time a play was acting within, as was done almost every day in the neighbourhood, but they were such poor performances that I never attended. I observed that, after the juice had been squeezed out of the chewed pepper root for the chief, the fibres were carefully picked up and taken away by one of his servants. On my asking what he intended to do with it, I was told he would put water to it and strain it again. Thus he would make what I will call small beer. The twenty-third wind easterly, as it had been ever since we left Otaheite. Early in the morning we unmoored, and at eight weighed and put to sea. The good old chief was the last man who went out of the ship. At parting I told him we should see each other no more, at which he wept and said, Let your sons come, we will treat them well. Ori is a good man in the utmost sense of the word, but many of the people are far from being of that disposition, and seem to take advantage of his old age. Teradere, his grandson and heir, being yet but a youth, the gentle treatment the people of this isle ever met with from me, and the careless and imprudent manner in which many of our people had rambled about in the country, from a vain opinion that firearms rendered them invincible, encouraged many at Wahene to commit acts of violence, which no man at Otaheite ever durst attempt. During our stay here we got breadfruit, coconuts, etc., more than we could well consume, but not hogs enough by far to supply our daily expense, and yet it did not appear that they were scarce in the isle. It must be allowed, however, that the number we took away, when last here, must have thinned them greatly, and at the same time stocked the isle with our articles. Besides, we now wanted a proper assortment of trade, 
which we had being nearly exhausted, and the few remaining red feathers being here but of little value, when compared to the estimation they stand in at Otaheite. This obliged me to set the smiths to work, to make different sorts of iron tools, nails, etc., in order to enable me to procure refreshments at the other isles, and to support my credit and influence among the natives. End of Book 2 Chapter 14 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Chapter 15 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole Chapter 15 Arrival at Ulitea with an account of the reception we met with there, and the several incidents which happened during our stay. A report of two ships being at Wahene. Preparations to leave the island, and the regret the inhabitants showed on the occasion. The character of Oedidi, with some general observations on the islands. 1774 May. As soon as we were clear of the harbour we made sail and stood over for the south end of Ulitea. Ori took the opportunity to send a man with a message to Opuni. Being little wind all the latter part of the day, it was dark before we reached the west side of the isle, where we spent the night. The same light variable wind continued till ten o'clock next morning, when the trade wind at east prevailed, and we ventured to ply up to the harbour, first sending a boat to lie in anchorage in the entrance. After making a few trips we got before the channel, and with all our sails set, and the headway the ship had acquired, shut her in as far as she would go, then dropped the anchor and took in the sails. This is the method of getting into most of the harbours which are on the lee side of these isles for the channels in general are too narrow to ply in. We were now anchored between the two points of the reef which form the entrance, each not more than two-thirds the length of a cable from us, and on which the sea broke with such height and violence as to people less acquainted with the place would have been terrible. Having all our boats out with anchors and warps in them, which were presently run out, the ship warped into safety, where we dropped anchor for the night. While this work was going forward, my old friend Ori the chief and several more came to see us. The chief came not empty. Next day we warped the ship into a proper berth and moored her so as to command all the shores around us. In the meantime a party of us went ashore to pay the chief a visit and to make the customary present. At our first entering his house, we were met by four or five old women, weeping and lamenting, as it were, most bitterly, and at the same time cutting their heads, with instruments made of shark's teeth, till the blood ran plentifully down their faces and on their shoulders. What was still worse, we were obliged to submit to the embraces of these old hags, and by that means were all besmeared with blood. This ceremony, for it was merely such, being over, they went out, washed themselves, and immediately after appeared as cheerful as any of the company. Having made some little stay, and given my present to the chief and his friends, he put a hog and some fruit into my boat, and came on board with us to dinner. In the afternoon we had a vast number of people in canoes about us, from different parts of the island. They all took up their quarters in our neighbourhood, where they remained feasting for some days. We understood that most of them were Iri Oyes. The twenty-sixth afforded nothing remarkable, excepting that Mr. Forster, in his botanical excursions, saw a burying place for dogs, which they called Marai no Te Uri, but I think we ought not to look upon this as one of their customs because few dogs die a natural death, being generally, if not always, killed and eaten, or else given as an offering to the gods. 
Probably this might be a marais or altar, where this sort of offering was made, or it might have been the whim of some person to have buried his favourite dog in this manner. But be it as it will, I cannot think it is a general custom in the nation, and for my own part I neither saw nor heard of any such thing before. Early in the morning of the 27th, Ori, his wife, son, daughter, and several more of his friends made us a visit, and brought with them a good quantity of all manner of refreshments, little having as yet been got from anybody else. They stayed dinner, after which a party of us accompanied them on shore, where we were entertained with a play called Midijij Harami, which signifies the child is coming. It concluded with the representation of a woman in labour, acted by a set of great brawny fellows, one of whom at last brought forth a strapping boy about six feet high, which ran about the stage, dragging after him a large wisp of straw, which hung by a string from his middle. I had an opportunity of seeing this acted another time, when I observed that the moment they had got hold of the fellow who represented the child, they flattened or pressed his nose. From this I judged that they do so by their children when born, which may be the reason why all in general have flat noses. This part of the play, from its newness, and the ludicrous manner in which it was performed, gave us, the first time we saw it, some entertainment, and caused a loud laugh, which may be the reason why they acted it so often afterwards. But this, like all their other pieces, could entertain us no more than once, especially as we could gather little from them, for want of knowing more of their language. The twenty-eighth was spent by me in much the same manner as the preceding day, viz. in entertaining my friends, and being entertained by them. Mr. Forster and his party in the country botanizing. Next morning we found several articles had been stolen, out of our boats lying at the buoy, about sixty or seventy yards from the ship. As soon as I was informed of it, I went to the chief to acquaint him therewith. I found that he not only knew they were stolen, but by whom and where they were, and he went immediately with me in my boat in pursuit of them. After proceeding a good way along shore, towards the south end of the island, the chief ordered us to land near some houses, where we did not wait long before all the articles were brought to us except the pinnace's iron tiller, which I was told was still further off. But when I wanted to go after it, I found the chief unwilling to proceed, and he actually gave me the slip, and retired into the country. Without him I knew I could do nothing. The people began to be alarmed when they saw I was for going farther, by which I concluded that the tiller was out of their reach also. I therefore sent one of them to the chief to desire him to return. He returned accordingly when we sat down and had some victuals set before us, thinking perhaps that, as I had not breakfasted, I must be hungry and not in a good humour. Thus I was amused till two hogs were produced, which they entreated me to accept. This I did, and then their fears vanished, and I thought myself not ill off in having gotten two good hogs for a thing which seemed to be quite out of my reach. Matters being thus settled, we returned on board, and had the company of the chief and his son to dinner. After that we all went ashore, where a play was acted for the entertainment of such as would spend their time in looking at it. Beside these plays, which the chief caused frequently to be acted, there was a set of strolling players in the neighbourhood, who performed every day. But their pieces seemed to be so much alike, that we soon grew tired of them, especially as we could not collect any interesting circumstances from them. We, our ship, and our country, were frequently brought on the stage, 
but on what account I know not. It can hardly be doubted that this was designed as a compliment to us, and probably not acted but when some of us were present. I generally appeared at Ori's theatre towards the close of the play, and twice at the other, in order to give my might to the actors. The only actress at Ori's theatre was his daughter, a pretty brown girl at whose shrine on these occasions many offerings were made by her numerous votaries. This, I believe, was one great inducement to her father's giving us these entertainments so often. Early in the morning on the 30th I set out with the two boats, accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters, OEDD, the chief, his wife, son, and daughter, for an estate which OEDD called his, situated at the north end of the island. There I was promised to have hogs and fruit in abundance, but when we came there we found that poor OEDD could not command one single thing, whatever right he might have to the wen oon a which was now in possession of his brother, who, soon after we landed, presented to me, with the usual ceremony, two pigs. I made him a very handsome present in return, and OEDD gave him everything he had left of what he had collected during the time he was with us. After this ceremony was over, I ordered one of the pigs to be killed and dressed for dinner, and attended myself to the whole operation, which was as follows. They first strangled the hog, which was done by three men. The hog being placed on his back, two of them laid a pretty strong stick across his throat, and pressed with all their might on each end. The third man held his hind legs, kept him on his back, and plugged up his fundament with grass, I suppose to prevent any air from passing or repassing that way. In this manner they held him for about ten minutes, before he was quite dead. In the meantime, some hands were employed in making a fire to heat the oven which was close by. As soon as the hog was quite dead, they laid him on the fire and burnt or singed the hair, so that it came off with almost the same ease as if it had been scalded. As the hair was got off one part, Another was applied to the fire, till they had got off the whole, yet not so clean, but that another operation was necessary, which was to carry it to the seaside, and there give it a good scrubbing with sandy stones and sand. This brought off all the scurf, etc., which the fire had left on. After well washing off the sand and dirt, the carcass was brought again to the former place, and laid on clean green leaves, in order to be opened. They first ripped up the skin of the belly, and took out the fat or lard from between the skin and the flesh, which they laid on a large green leaf. The belly was then ripped open, and the entrails taken out, and carried them away in a basket, so that I know not what became of them, but am certain they were not thrown away. The blood was next taken out and put into a large leaf, and then the lard, which was put to the other fat. The hog was now washed clean, both inside and out with fresh water, and several hot stones put into his belly, which were shaken in under the breast, and green leaves crammed in upon them. By this time the oven was sufficiently heated. What fire remained was taken away, together with some of the hot stones. The rest made a kind of pavement in the bottom of the hole or oven, and were covered with leaves, on which the hog was placed on his belly. The lard and fat, after being washed with water, were put into a vessel, made just then of the green bark of the plantain tree, together with two or three hot stoves, and placed on one side the hog. A hot stone was put to the blood, which was tied up in the leaf and put into the oven, as also breadfruit and plantains. Then the hole was covered with green leaves, on which were laid the remainder of the hot stones. Over them were leaves. Then any sort of rubbish they could lay their hands on, finishing the operation 
by well covering the whole with earth. While the victuals were breaking, a table was spread with green leaves on the floor, at one end of a large boar house. At the close of two hours and ten minutes, the oven was opened and all the victuals taken out. Those of the natives who dined with us sat down by themselves at one end of the table, and we at the other. The hog was placed before us, and the fat and blood before them, on which they chiefly dined, and said it was mamity, very good victuals, and we not only said but thought the same of the pork. The hog weighed about fifty pounds, some parts about the ribs I thought rather overdone, but the more fleshy parts were excellent, and the skin, which by the way of our dressing can hardly be eaten, had by this method a taste and flavour superior to anything I ever met with of the kind. I have now only to add that during the whole of the various operations they exhibited a cleanliness well worthy of imitation. I had been the more particular in this account, because I do not remember that any of us had seen the whole process before, nor is it well described in the narrative of my former voyage. While dinner was preparing, I took a view of this Wenua of Oididi. It was a small but a pleasant spot, and the houses were so disposed as to form a very pretty village, which is very rarely the case at these isles. Soon after we had dined, we set out for the ship with the other pig and a few races of plantains, which proved to be the sum total of our great expectations. In our return to the ship, we put ashore at a place where, in the corner of a house, we saw four wooden images, each two feet long, standing on a shelf, having a piece of cloth round their middle, and a kind of turban on their heads, in which were stuck long feathers of cocks. A person in the house told us they were Iatua no te tautu, gods of the servants or slaves. I doubt if this be sufficient to conclude that they pay them divine worship, and that the servants or slaves are not allowed the same gods as men of more elevated rank. I never heard that Tupia made any such distinction, or that they worshipped any visible thing whatever. Besides, these were the first wooden gods we had seen in any of the isles, and all the authority we had for their being such was the bare word of perhaps a superstitious person, and whom, too, we were liable to misunderstand. It must be allowed that the people of this isle are in general more superstitious than at Otaheite. At the first visit I made to the chief after our arrival, he desired I would not suffer any of my people to shoot herons and woodpeckers, birds as sacred with them as robin redbreasts, swallows, etc., are with many old women in England. Tupia, who was a priest and well acquainted with their religion, customs, traditions, etc., played little or no regard to these birds. I mention this because some amongst us were of opinion that these birds are their Iatuas, or gods. We indeed fell into this opinion when I was here in 1769, and into some others still more absurd, which we had undoubtedly adopted, if Tupia had not undeceived us. A man of his knowledge and understanding we have not since met with, and consequently have had nothing to his account of their religion, but superstitious notions. On the 31st the people knowing that we should sail soon, began to bring more fruit on board than usual. Among those who came was a young man who measured six feet four inches and six tenths, and his sister, younger than him, measured five feet ten inches and a half. 1774 June A brisk trade for hogs and fruit continued on the 1st of June. On the 2nd in the afternoon, we got intelligence that three days before, two ships had arrived at Wahene. The same report said, the one was commanded by Mr. Banks, and the other by Captain Furneaux. The man who brought the account said, 
he was made drunk on board one of them, and described the persons of Mr. Banks and Captain Furneaux so well, that I had not the least doubt of the truth, and began to consider about sending a boat over that very evening, with orders to Captain Furneaux, when a man, a friend of Mr. Forster, happened to come on board, and denied the whole, saying that it was Waware, a lie. The man from whom we had the intelligence was now gone, so that we could not confront them, and there were none else present who knew anything about it but by report, so that I laid aside sending over a boat till I should be better informed. This evening we entertained the people with fireworks on one of the little isles near the entrance of the harbour. I had fixed on the next day for sailing, but the intelligence from Wahene put a stop to it. The chief had promised to bring the man on board who first brought the account, but he was either not to be found or would not appear. In the morning the people were divided in their opinions, but in the afternoon all said it was a false report. I had sent Mr. Clark, in the morning, to the farthest part of the island, to make inquiries there he returned without learning anything satisfactory. In short, the report appeared now too ill-founded to authorize me to send a boat over, or to wait any longer here, and therefore early in the morning of the 4th I got everything in readiness to sail. Ori the chief and his old family came on board to take their last farewell, accompanied by Uuru, the Iri Dihi, and Boba, the Iri of Otaha, and several of their friends. None of them came empty, but Uuru brought a pretty large present, this being his first and only visit. I distributed amongst them almost everything I had left. The very hospitable manner in which I had ever been received by these people had endeared them to me, and given them a just title to everything in my power to grant. I questioned them again about the ships at Wahene, and they all to a man denied that any were there. During the time these people remained on board, they were continually importuning me to return. The chief, his wife and daughter, but especially the two latter, scarcely ever ceased weeping. I will not pretend to say whether it was real or feigned grief, they showed on this occasion. Perhaps there was a mixture of both. But were I to abide by my own opinion only, I should believe it was real. At last, when we were about to weigh, they took a most affectionate leave. Ori's last request was for me to return. When he saw he could not obtain that promise, he asked the name of my Marai, burying ground. As strange a question as this was, I hesitated not a moment to tell him Stepney, the parish in which I live when in London. I was made to repeat it several times over till they could pronounce it. Then Stepney Marai no Tuti was echoed through a hundred mouths at once. I afterwards found the same question had been put to Mr. Forster by a man on shore, but he gave a different and indeed more proper answer by saying no man who used the sea could say where he should be buried. It is the custom at these isles for all the great families to have burial places of their own, where their remains are interred. These go with the estate to the next heir. The Marai at Opari in Otahiti, where Tutuha swayed the scepter, was called Marai no Tutaha, but now it is called Marai no Otu. What greater proof could we have of these people esteeming us as friends than their wishing to remember us even beyond the period of our lives? They had been repeatedly told that we should see them no more. They then wanted to know where we to, were to mingle with our parent dust. As I could not promise or even suppose that more English ships would be sent to these isles, our faithful companion, OEDD, chose to remain in his native country. 
but he left us with a regret fully demonstrative of the esteem he bore to us nor could anything but the fear of never returning have torn him from us when the chief teased me so much about returning i sometimes gave such answers as left them hopes oedd would instantly catch at this take me on one side and ask me over again in short I have not words to describe the anguish which appeared in this young man's breast when he went away. He looked up at the ship, burst into tears, and then sunk down into the canoe. The maxim that a prophet has no honour in his own country was never more fully verified than in this youth. At Otaheite he might have had anything that was in their power to bestow, whereas here he was not in the least noticed. He was a youth of good parts, and like most of his countrymen, of a docile, gentle, and humane disposition, but in a manner wholly ignorant of their religion, government, manners, customs, and traditions. Consequently, no material knowledge could have been gathered from him had I brought him away. Indeed, he would have been a better specimen of the nation in every respect than Omai. Just as Oedidi was going out of the ship, he asked me to tattoo some paru for him, in order to show the commanders of any other ships which might stop here. I complied with his request, gave him a certificate of the time he had been with us, and recommended him to the notice of those who might afterwards touch at the island. We did not get clear of our friends till eleven o'clock when we weighed and put to sea. But OEDD did not leave us till we were almost out of the harbour. He stayed in order to fire some guns, for it being His Majesty's birthday, we fired the salute at going away. When I first came to these islands, I had some thought of visiting Tupia's famous Bola Bola but as I had now got on board a plentiful supply of all manner of refreshments, and the route I had in view allowing me no time to spare, I laid this design aside, and directed my course to the west, taking our final leave of these happy isles, on which benevolent nature has spread her luxuriant sweets with a lavish hand. The natives copying the bounty of nature are equally liberal, contributing plentifully and cheerfully to the wants of navigators. During the six weeks we had remained at them, we had fresh pork, and all the fruits which were in season, in the utmost profusion, besides fish at Otaheite and fowls at the other isles. All these articles we got in exchange for axes, hatchets, nails, chisels, cloth, red feathers, beads, knives, scissors, looking-glasses, etc., articles which will ever be valuable here. I ought not to omit shirts as a very capital article in making presents, especially with those who have any connection with the fair sex. A shirt here is full as necessary as a piece of gold in England. The ladies at Otaheite, after they had pretty well stripped their lovers of shirts, found a method of clothing themselves with their own cloth. It was their custom to go on shore every morning, and to return on board in the evening, generally clad in rags. This furnished a pretense to importune the lover for better clothes, and when he had no more of his own, he was to dress them in new cloth of the country, which they always left ashore, and appearing again in rags, they must again be clothed. So that the same suit might pass through twenty different hands, and to be as often sold, bought, and given away. Before I finish this account of these islands, it is necessary to mention all I know concerning the government of Ulitea and Otaha. Ori, so often mentioned, is a native of Bola Bola, but is possessed of Winuas, or lands at Ulitea, which I suppose he, as well as many of his countrymen, got at the conquest. He resides here as Opuni's lieutenant, seeming to be vested with regal authority, and to be the supreme magistrate in the island. Uuru, 
who is the Erie by hereditary right, seems to have little more left him than the bare title, and his own Wenua, or district, in which I think he is sovereign. I have always seen Ori pay him the respect due to his rank, and he was pleased when he saw me distinguish him from others. Otaha, so far as I can find, is upon the very same footing. Boba and Ota are the two chiefs. The latter I have not seen. Boba is a stout, well-made young man, and we were told is, after Opuni's death, to marry his daughter, by which marriage he will be vested with the same regal authority as Opuni has now. So that it would seem, though a woman may be vested with regal dignity, she cannot have regal power. I cannot find that Opuni has got anything to himself by the conquest of these isles, any farther than providing for his nobles, who have seized on best part of the lands. He seems to have no demand on them for any of the many articles they have had from us. OEDD has several times enumerated to me all the axes, nails, etc., which Opuni is possessed of, which hardly amount to as many as he had from me when I saw him in 1769. Old as this famous man is, he seems not to spend his last days in indolence. When we first arrived here, he was at Morana. Soon after he returned to Bola Bola, and, we were now told, he has gone to Tubi. I shall conclude this account of these islands with some observations on the watch, which Mr. Wales hath communicated to me. At our arrival at Matavai Bay in Otaheite, the longitude pointed out by the watch was two degrees, eight minutes, thirty-eight and a half seconds, too far to the west. That is, it had gained, since our leaving Queen Charlotte's Sound, of its then rate of going, eight minutes, thirty-four and a half seconds. This was in about five months or rather more, during which time it had passed through the extremes of cold and heat. It was judged that half this error arose after we left Easter Island, by which it appeared that it went better in the cold than in the hot climates. End of Book 2, Chapter 15 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts End of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1, by James Cook.